It is so good to see you this morning. It is a delight. It is a pleasure. It is an honor to be able to be here and open up God's Word with you. My name is Craig. I, like you saw in the video, am the student ministries director here at Meadowbrook Church. My wife, Kelsey, and I and our three kiddos have called Meadowbrook Church our church home for eight years now. And so we are continuing through our, our series in Colossians, All Fullness. Um, and so I, like most people, I'm a big fan of movies. Anybody a fan of movies out there? Of course. Most of you guys aren't raising your hands. That's okay. Um, I know you like movies. So I'm pretty picky uh, when it comes to having a favorite movie. One of my top ten favorite movies captures everything I'm looking for in a movie. It's got nostalgia. It's got good versus evil. It's got a strong lead actor. It's got classic songs. It's got Joe Pesci. Um, and even though it's July, we're going to talk about Home Alone. <laughs> right. Now, Home Alone, again, is in my top 10 year-round movie favorites. So that tells you how good it is. But it's also arguably one of the best Christmas movies. I'm up for having a debate later if you want to talk about that. So you might not think Home Alone has anything to do with the book of Colossians, uh, but it does. And I would argue that almost every movie contains a freedom story or a redemption story. Every movie contains a freedom story or a redemption story because most stories mirror the freedom and redemption that we see in Scripture, that we see in the Bible. So the main plot in Home Alone contains this message of reconciliation. I want to define reconciliation for you real quick. Um, reconciliation, if we have a definition on the screen, is to bring back a former state of harmony, to renew a friendship or to restore a right relationship. So that's the definition of reconciliation that we're going to be using and talking about this morning. So back to Home Alone, the important part. The main storyline, although it's really, really powerful, um, isn't really what I want to emphasize whatsoever. Um, Kevin has a mysterious old man for a neighbor uh, named Marley. I've got a picture of him on the screen. They, they meet, and Kevin gets to know him and hear his story, and he learns that old man Marley doesn't get to see his granddaughter at Christmas because he and his son has, have had a falling out, right? Because they don't talk anymore because they got in a big fight and a big argument. And now the grandfather's dealing with the repercussions of that, and he can't see his granddaughter at Christmas. They don't speak to each other. Now, Kevin McAllister, like all eight-year-olds, gives really wise, reasonable, and sound advice to Marley. And he's encouraging him. He said, you should talk to your son, right? And this image is a really, really powerful image. It's one of the, the last scenes we see in the film. It's Home Alone. Why am I crying? <laughs> uh, it's powerful. It is. It's special, right? Uh, it's, be it's beautiful because many of us know what it's like to be in a broken relationship, right? Many of us know what it's like to have a falling out with somebody else. And right? so the reconciliation that we see in this film strikes a chord because it's what we long for. It's what we want. And ultimately, we want, we want wrongs made right. We want disunity turned into unity. We desire healthy relationships. So the reconciliation that we see in our lives and in human relationships is just that. They're human, right? They're between other people. What about our reconciliation between us and God? What about our reconciliation between us and our Creator God? What about a right relationship with God? So that's what we're going to look at this morning. And we're going to learn about what it means to be reconciled to God through Christ. Because this is the only way a person can be reconciled to God. God the Father gave His only begotten Son as the only Savior from sin. Reconciliation, the idea, the definition, the process of reconciliation, assumes that there's a broken relationship. Reconciliation assumes that there's a broken relationship. So our big thought, our big idea, the big thing we want to hammer home, home this morning is reconciliation shows us our true, true selves before Christ and our true selves because of Christ. Reconciliation shows us our true selves before Christ and our true selves because of Christ. So that's exactly what we'll see here in this passage this morning in Colossians chapter 1. I invite you to turn there now. Colossians 1, verses 1, uh, 21 through 23. We're going to hit 
uh, three good things, three bad things, and three responsibilities that we draw from this passage. We're going to see three good things, we're going to see three bad things, and we're going to see three responsibilities that we draw from this passage. Please pray with me. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, as we open the pages of your word, I pray that you allow your light to shine and for us to have a, uh, minds that understand, hearts that comprehend what you're telling us, what you're telling us and what you're showing us in your word. Uh, Lord, I pray that we all desire to have a right relationship with you. And you've shown us that. And I pray that as we dig through the text this morning, that we'll grow closer to you, know more about you, and desire to live a light, holy life for you. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right, follow along with me. Colossians 1, 21 through 23, and the text is going to be on the screen as well. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, establish and firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven of which I, Paul, become a servant. So here's what's happening in the book of Colossians. Here's kind of why Paul, the author of Colossians, wrote it, what's happening in the church of Colossae right now. Um, so in the, in the Colossae church, there were teachings and there were questions about the authenticity of the gospel, right? There was different teachings and different questions about asking, hey, is the gospel really authentic? Is the gospel really true? The, these false teachings claim that Christ didn't possess, possess any divine nature about him. He wasn't God. They suggested that there are additional things, additional revelations that were necessary, this kind of higher knowledge, higher, uh, higher knowledge or um, different things that provided salvation, right? And it, in this letter to the Colossians that we're reading here, Paul aims to explain and helps try to defend the idea that Christ is supreme, right? That Christ is God, that Christ is Lord. He previously emphasized that God, God's fullness resides in Christ, essentially affirming that Christ is God himself, like we see in Colossians 1.19. And additionally, he asserts that the reconciliation of all things occurs through Christ in verse 20, right? So we're going through 21 through 23, and we're actually starting out just with verse 21. So we can put that on the screen. We're going to hit the three bad things that we see coming from verse 21. Um, and we see that it's, we're alienated from God. We're enemies in your mind, enemies in your own mind and we have evil behavior. So those are our three bad things. We're alienated from God. We're enemies in our own mind and have evil behavior. So in verse 21, Paul presents the Colossian church with these three negatives, right? These three realities of what they were once like. Now notice alienation from God. I have a kind of a, a description of what alienation from God means. It means you're estranged. It means you're cut off. It means that you're separated from God. So we're all detached from God because of sin. Not just the, the people in the church of, of Colossae right now, in this, the passage we're reading. All of humanity is estranged, cut off, separated, and alienated from God. Right? That's what we are before Christ. Right? So this method of showing people the bad things or what they were like before Christ is really common in Paul's writing. He does the same thing to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians 2. Uh, the beginning of Ephesians 2, he says words like, you were dead in your sins and trespasses absolutely dead, spiritually dead people, right? They all live like that at one time is what Paul says. That you're alienated from God. You're carrying out the passions of the body and of the mind. You're separated from Christ. The greatest part we see in Ephesians 2, Paul says, but God, but God made you alive, right? We're far off at first. We're dead in sin. We're hopeless. We're apart from God. And that's a horrible thing to be. I have a picture that I want to show you just as a simple like, image of what it looks like for us to be separated from God, right? It's this gulf, it's this chasm, it's this big gaping space between us and God, right? Completely separated, completely estranged, unable to be having a right relationship with God or be in a relationship with God. That gap, that chasm, that alienation between us and God is sin, right? And everybody is born into that. So not only do we see this alienation ground, we also see the second, 
of the three bad things, we see Paul points out that they're enemies in their mind, which can also be translated as hostile, can also be translated as hateful. So not only are we separated from God by our sin nature and our condition, but we're, we're separated because of our own attitude towards God, our own rebellion towards God. I mean, I don't, we don't need God. I don't want God. The biggest argument that I hear from, from people about what it means to have a, a relationship with Jesus Christ or why they don't believe the Bible, why don't they believe in Jesus, why don't they believe the gospel, is because most of the time they don't really want to be held accountable. People don't want to have to have higher authority. People like being their own gods, right? So if somebody says, oh, I don't believe in God, right? If you peel back all of the layers and get down to the true heart nature behind it, it's like we, we like being in charge, right? And when we are in charge of all things, even the things that we don't have control over, power over, we like to be in charge of our own destiny or dir direction, right? We're playing God. We're living in rebellion, and we're not submitting to the creator God. So he points out we're alienated from God, we're enemies in our own mind, and then the final bad thing is evil behavior, is the evil behavior we see in Colossians 1.21. And Jesus himself points out our evil desires and our evil behavior in John 3. 19 and 20, Jesus says, light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of the light because of their evil deeds. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. So Christ is that light, and the light reveals things that we don't want to expose, like our true and selfish, sinful hearts. We often want to to, we often want to struggle with acknowledging about having sinful hearts. I, I, I'm not hostile. I'm not hateful. I'm a good person. I haven't done very many things wrong or bad things. I screw up once in a while, but I'm decent enough. Right? Sin is the root cause of all these bad things. Right? We see in Scripture... Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is nobody without excuse, regardless of how great or wide or big or small the sin is. Sin is the root cause of all of these bad things that Paul's pointing out in, one, in one, uh, chapter 1, verse 21. The cause for the alienation, the cause for their, the enemies in their own minds, the cause for their evil behavior. God does not fellowship with sin. God cannot fellowship with sin. Right? Sin needs to be dealt with before there can be reconciliation between God and man. There's a story of a little boy who was rebelling against his dad constantly. This boy was destroying his own life with his rebellion, and he refused to listen to his father. One day the dad said to the boy, I want to show you what you're doing to your life. I'm going to put a wooden post in our front yard and every time you rebel, every time you disobey, I'm going to drive a nail into the post. Every time you obey, every time you listen, every time you do what is right, I'm going to pull out a nail. So the first thought the boy had was, I'm going to do everything I can to fill that post with nails. And he did. In two months' time, he filled that post with nails. But he also began to feel the damage he was doing to his own life, to his parents' life. And with true remorse, slowly but surely, the boy began to obey his father. And one by one, the nails came out. And when the last nail came out of the post, the boy fell apart and broke down in tears. The dad said, son, why are you crying? And the boy replied, I got rid of the nails, but I can't get rid of the holes. When we see these three bad things in verse 21, we can feel like that kid. We can get that way. We see the bad things like being alienated and separated from God, right? That we're enemies in our own mind, having evil behavior. You probably ask the questions, how do we recover? How do we get better? How do we get over this? How do we fix it? How can I make it right? And the answer, right, the solution, the remedy to the, our alienation from God is verse 22. 
right? Verse 23, verse 22. But now he, God, has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish, and free from accusation. This is the reconciliation of God through Christ's sacrifice on the cross. What makes recognizing these bad things important is not to dwell on our sin life, not to dwell on our harmful, destructive life before Christ. What Colossians 1.21 does is it shows us our need for reconciliation. It reminds us. It's saying, look, look at who you were. Look where you came from. Look at what you once were. Look at what God saved you from. Look at what your life was like before Christ. It gives us purpose. It gives us meaning. It gives us thankfulness. It gives us gratitude at what God saves us from and who he saves us through. Because reconciliation shows us our true selves before Christ and our true selves because because of Christ. So follow along here in verse 22. Here, uh, verse 22, because of the reconciliation that God started and God made happen, we have three good things all mapped out in verse 22. These things that Paul shares with the Colossian church. He says that through the reconciliation, that through that Christ's sacrifice, we might be presented holy in God's sight. Holy meaning no longer separated from God, but now separated from sin. And we're set apart for God. That's what it means to be holy. Set apart for God. Because God sent his son to die for us. His perfect life, taking on the sins of the world, giving us a new and right relationship with God. God not only views us, God now views us as holy and as holy as Jesus. Not by anything that we've done, not by anything that we add to it, not by anything of our contribution, but by Christ's finishing work on the cross. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So the three good things that we are made holy in God's sight, presented as holy, but the second thing, not just holy, but without blemish. Some translations might say blameless. Without blemish and blameless. The reconciliation that God takes away the stain of sin of our past, right? Kind of our past life is represented in that stain, in that mark, in that strike against us. He makes it as white as snow. Presented as holy, blameless, or without blemish. And the third good thing, that we are free from accusation. There's no charge against us. There's no record. There's no scorecard. Whereas before, the three bad things equaled separation from God, eternal separation from God due to our evil and enemy mindsets, our evil behavior, right? Those things we had in verse 21 are gone. They don't matter anymore. Those things are meaningless because of the restored relationship with God. They carry no weight. So Paul states that through Christ's death, redeemed man has now become without blemish, free from accusation. But how? Right? What changed? How can a sinful man be made holy in God's sight? Right? So here we see a major truth seen throughout all of Scripture called substitution. So if we think back to the Old Testament, we think back to the, the bigger chunk of Scripture, the Old Testament, to the, early in the Old Testament, the first five books of the Bible, sometimes called the, the, the Pentateuch, sometimes called um, the, the Torah. Um, so we see the laws that God set up for his people through Moses. And under Mosaic law, God establishes a sacrificial system that teaches mankind that without the shedding of blood, there's going to be no removal of sin. And that's what, that's the, that's the wages of sin means death. And so therefore, there had to be a just punishment. So the Israelites had a very precise, precise and very exact temple, um, kind of a temple sacrifice. God would symbolically punish the sins of man on a, on a sacrificial lamb. I think I have an image of that. So that the people could enter his presence and worship him, right? So they have, have a, a lamb of a certain age. It's completely pure, right? And so they would symbolically put the sins of the people on this sacrificial lamb so that the people could enter into his presence and enter and worship God. And so in fact, scholars see this doctrine of substitution modeled in the very first death that we see in the first book of the Bible in Genesis, right? So Adam and Eve, they sin against God. They sin in the Garden of Eden. And God immediately 
kills an animal and clothes Adam and Eve. The wages of sin is death. So someone had to die for Adam and Eve's sin. So from the very beginning, God displays mercy to man by allowing a substitute. And here's the thing. The sacrificial animal never took away the whole sins of the world. It symbolized only a future reality. So we're jumping from the Old Testament all the way to the New Testament, right? Before even Jesus starts his, before Jesus starts his earthly ministry, we see John the Baptist, right? We see John the Baptist proclaiming the coming of the Messiah. And when John the Baptist first sees Jesus on earth, he says, look, Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So the sacrificial lamb in the Old Testament was only a, a depiction of substitution, right? The people symbolically received the sinless life of the lamb, and the lamb shouldered the sins of the people and died for them. So this symbolized that the perfect lamb would have to die for the sins of the entire world, and that's Jesus Christ. There's an artist that I follow. His website and social media platforms and stuff like that, his, his name, it's called Full of Eyes, and I want to give him the credit for this, this depiction, right, of, of Jesus Christ as a sacrificial lamb, right? And the beauty of that image, right, is you see the lamb has already been slain. We see that in the book of Revelation, right? That all the evil things and all the evil powers of, powers of the world are going after the slain lamb. And that, that slain lamb will still rise up is still the sufficient sacrifice, the sufficient substitution for the people because of his relationship with God, because he is God. By God sacrificing himself and sacrificing his son, we have eternal life. That's Jesus Christ. Jesus' sacrifice was not a symbol. It was reality. Right? There literally was a substitution when he died on the cross for the sins of the people. He took the sins of every person in the world and bore the wrath of God for them. Right? He took our sin and we received his righteousness. That's what Paul means when he says we are presented holy. We are presented blameless. We are sent free of, presented as free as accusation in God's sight. Listen again to what he says. But now he's reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. The only way for human beings to be reconciled to God was through the substitutionary death of the perfect lamb, Jesus. Right? We are now acceptable to God when he, because he sees us as his perfect son. His righteousness is now applied to our account. So reconciliation shows us our true selves because of Christ. We looked at the three bad things in verse 21. We looked at the three good things in verse 22. And for Christians, there are three responsibilities we can take away from verse, 20, verse 23. So take a look at verse 23 with me right now. Paul tells us first that we need to continue in the faith, established and firm. And remember that Paul's addressing the Colossians who are dealing with different or false teachings in the church that were questioning, they were questioning the gospel, they were questioning Jesus, and his reminder and his firm exhortation here is if you are truly reconciled to Christ, you must persevere. If you are truly reconciled to Christ, you must truly persevere. You must continue in your faith, continue in, your tr in the truth of the gospel. Otherwise, you were never really reconciled to begin with. So my wife Kelsey and I have three kids, and our, our firstborn son, our middle child, um, his name is Lincoln. He's three years old. His name is Lincoln. His name didn't have huge significance. Um, we're not hardcore Abe Lincoln fans. Um, he's an amazing president. Like, he's a, good, he's a great president. He was a great president. But we, we named Link because at the time, it was the only name my wife and I could agree upon. <laughs> and we learned later that Lincoln, and his name means Lake Settlement, or set, Settler by the Water. Very inspiring. Um, but at a child dedication, uh, our senior pastor, Brian Marvel, read Psalm 1. And we connected with it so much that we made Lincoln, his life verse, kind of the, the verse that we want to 
you know, press into and pour into his life. We made Psalm 1, his first three verses, um, his life verse. I'm going to read them for you right now. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. We want that for our son. We want that for all of our children. That's what Paul wants for the church in Colossae. That's what it means to continue in the faith. That's what it means to be established and firm. Deeply rooted like a tree planted by the water. To be a people who delight in the Lord and meditate upon his law day and night. And if that happens, if you do that, of course, you will be established and you will be firm, just like Paul says in verse 23. Paul also tells the church to do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, to stick to the true gospel message, not the false teaching that was flying around in the Colossian church at the time, but to stay true to the hope in the gospel, to do not move from Christ. Without a firm and established foundation, we could be taken away and off to anywhere. I'm sure you've seen a lot of people walking away from their faith throughout the course of your life, even the last few years. What Paul's saying in Colossians 1.23, do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. Right? Do not be led away, led astray, or blown away from the other things that the world and the culture has to offer. So the first two responsibilities we have as followers of Christ and as Christians is to continue in faith, establish and firm, to do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. And the third and final thing is we see what Paul is doing and we see what Paul is all about in that last half of verse 23. This is the gospel that you heard that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Paul is a servant of the gospel. Paul is a proclaimer of the gospel. And, and that is what he does to this church in Colossae and what he did throughout all the New Testament and what he's doing to our church right now, thousands of years later. He's proclaiming the gospel. That serves as a call and it serves as a reminder to us of what we should be about as Christians. Right? We should be about proclaiming the gospel. So reconciliation shows us our true selves before Christ and our true selves because of Christ. Now, the Christians who are listening, regardless of when your walk with Christ started, it could have been decades ago. You could have been walking with the Lord for a long time. It could have been years ago. It could have been months ago. It could have been a few days ago. We need to know who we once were in order, to in order to rejoice in who we are now. So regardless of when your journey with Christ started, we need to know who we once were in order to rejoice in who we are now. The reconciliation we received as a reward is now a responsibility. Think about that. The reconciliation... The right relationship that you've received from God is now a responsibility. The responsibility of the reconciled, we see it in 2 Corinthians. Paul says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled himself, reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed us the message of reconciliation. We, therefore, are Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. He has committed to us as Christians the message of reconciliation. To them, the message of the gospel. We've been committed. We are Christ's ambassadors. Our responsibility is to be firmly established and steadfast, not move away from the hope of the gospel. 
And our foundation is critical, right? The foundation for the Christian faith is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our lives should be so saturated in God and so saturated in his, his word that it should pour out of everything that we say and we do and how we act. Because we've been committed to the gospel of reconciliation. The reconciliation we once received as a reward is now a responsibility. You can probably think back to the, fir- the person or the people who first shared the good news of the gospel to you. It could be a parent, it could be a family member, it could be a loved one, it could be a friend, it could be a coworker, it could be a complete stranger. You could think back to that person and what they were doing and what they were saying to you. It could have been in church, it could have been outside of a church. Because the, re- the reward of reconciliation, because we have a right relationship with God now, it's now our responsibility to share that and proclaim that good news to everybody else. Because if people hadn't done that, if Paul didn't do that, we wouldn't be sitting here today. And church wouldn't exist. Think about that. We have a responsibility as Christians and as followers of Jesus Christ to make the gospel known and proclaim the gospel. That's what we're being called to do and committed to do. So the question is, are you clear on the gospel? Do you understand the gospel message? If I asked you to turn to your neighbor and explain it in 60 seconds, could you do it? Could you support it with specific scripture or specific Bible verses? Some of you could. Right? Some of you could wipe the floor with me because of your knowledge of scripture. Are the words that you heard from God's word this morning enough to stir you to action, to think about the person in your life who needs the gospel, who needs to know Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. There's people in your life that need that, need to hear that. So who are those people? Think about them. Lock them in your mind. That's your mission field. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the the good news of Jesus Christ, the reconciliation that you receive from God is to be shared with others. So that's your challenge and that's your encouragement. And the struggle that everybody faces, myself included, is a word about how people are going to react. How are people going to respond? When I say, hey, your worldview doesn't line up with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The message of the cross will always be foolishness to some and offensiveness to others. The message of the gospel will always be foolishness to some and offensive to others, but to those who believe it, it is the power of God and salvation. That's all I have to say. If you're sitting here this morning And you don't know if you can call yourself a Christian. You don't know if you're a follower of Christ. Maybe somebody invited you. Maybe you've been coming solo for a while. Maybe you've been attending with your spouse. If you don't call yourself a believer, you just heard the gospel this morning. You saw what our life looks like, right? Those three bad things, you're in it. You're living in it. It sucks. Jesus Christ came into the world not to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. He says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So if you don't follow, call yourself a follower of Christ, if you don't call yourself a Christian, think about the words that we just read this morning. And think about the message that Paul is telling the church, the church in Colossae, but also the church today. Right? Look at your life before Christ, right? And if you have not Realize that you need Christ for salvation. Look at that now and take action. 
Do something. If it wasn't for the people in my life that shared the gospel with me when I needed it the most, if they were too concerned or too afraid or too fearful, I wouldn't be here right now. Most of us wouldn't be here right now. We are called to be activated for the gospel of Jesus Christ and tell others about it. All right? Because reconciliation that like we saw all morning long showed us and shows us what our lives look like before Christ, right? And what our, looks like, what our lives look like because of Christ. And we can go out and make a difference and share that good news and share the gospel and share the reconciliation that God has given us. We can do that with others. Uh, and my, my challenge is to do that this week, right? Um, I'm going to close in prayer and invite the worship team to come on up. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for just the gospel message and the truth um, that we see in Scripture. Uh, it's a challenge, God, to fight against the sinful, fleshly nature of, our, of ourselves. It's a battle. It's a struggle, uh, regardless of who we are. But because of Christ and because of his sacrifice, we have been set free from that. We have been set free from sin. Uh, we are not alienated. We are not separated. We are not cut off from God because of Christ. He is the bridge. He fills the gap. He fills in the holes. He makes things right. and He makes things good through his sacrifice. God, so this morning, I pray for this, this, this church. I pray for these people. I pray for each and every one of us that we think long and hard about what it means to walk in all fullness of Christ. What it means to proclaim the gospel to the people that need to hear it the most. Because if we, haven't heard, if we didn't hear the gospel, if somebody didn't share the message with us, I don't want to think about where we'd be, God. Lord, I pray that we just take up the challenge of proclaiming the gospel to the world around us and help bring people into a right relationship with you. Lord, allow, allow this time, allow this worship, allow this day, and allow this week to be for you, for, to be for your glory. Uh, we trust you, Lord. We love you. We pray this in uh, Jesus' mighty name. Amen.